It's DA on CBS Sports Radio. Aw, we appreciate the love around here. The DA show each and every morning, 6 until 10 Eastern Time, 3 until 7 Pacific, on the hundreds of affiliates nationwide and north of the border on CBS Sports Radio. Our next guest was just a fan, but he loved baseball so much, he thrust himself into the game and the lifestyle. He became a clubhouse attendant, for two seasons for the Aberdeen Ironbirds, the minor league affiliate short season single A of the Baltimore Orioles, just up the road from Baltimore. He has written a book called Clubby about all those crazy madcap experiences behind the scenes as a clubhouse attendant and the fallout around it. Joining us this morning on the show, you can watch as well at watchda.com with the simulcast and you can watch on Twitch by going to the CBS Sports Radio channel, is author Greg Larson. Greg, good morning. How you doing? Doing great, DA. I'm down here in Austin, Texas. I got water and power and all that good stuff back now, so I'm ready to go. Water and power in Austin is actually a big deal these days. How bad did you get hit with the snow last week? Um, my apartment got down to 43 degrees at Woo! one point. So, but I have a fireplace, which is better than a lot of people here in Texas, so I'm okay, ready to go. Were you sleeping in hoodies and jackets and hats, or could you put on a, a fire and actually be decently warm? No, I was. I didn't want to light my apartment on fire, so yeah. I had a, the fire die when I fell asleep. I had the hoodie on, hat, everything, three layers. Better or worse, was it tougher than two years as a clubhouse attendant living in a closet? <laughs> it was shockingly similar, if you'd believe it, <laughs> as far as... Difficulty goes. When I was in the, uh, you know, we're both New York Penn League alums here. Yeah. Hudson Valley Renegades, Aberdeen yeah. Ironbirds, New York Penn League no longer exists. Uh, my second season as a clubby for the Ironbirds, I was actually living in the equipment closet in Ripken Stadium for the entire oh season. Gosh. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> so how did you even get in there? You were just a fan before that. You don't have a background in baseball, right? Well, technically, I was a fan. I played about 48 hours of Division Three baseball with the Hamlin Pipers in St. Paul, Minnesota, before I was cut. And then, oddly enough, I transferred to Winthrop University, where I was on a baseball scholarship for washing jock straps. I was the equipment manager there on a baseball scholarship. And so, like, when I graduated in 2011, that was the only job experience I had in the entire world, was cleaning up equipment, uh, jock strap washing, all that. I graduate college. That's my job experience. I love the game. I say, screw it, man. I see an opening in the New York Penn League. I'm going to become a clubhouse attendant. I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Uh, if I had known what two seasons in a minor league baseball clubhouse would be like, I would hesitate to take the job, but I think I would still do it for sure. Where does the job clubhouse attendant get listed? Like That's not on LinkedIn, is it? I found it on Teamwork Online, which is like this listing for a bunch of random pro professional sports jobs, which okay. is crazy. It was a fluke. Like Those jobs do not get listed online ever. They're passed yeah. down to somebody's nephew. They're passed down to generation by generation. So it was just like this magical circumstance. Author Greg Larson, our guest this morning here on the DA Show. So you get the job. What is your first holy crap moment about be when you are now the new clubby with the Ironbirds? The first, it's going to sound counterintuitive, but it was when I found the player handbook. Um, I stole, there's like only one player handbook from the Orioles for each minor leaguer. And some guy was, was gone that day. And so I just swiped the player handbook, totally not kosher thing to do. Um, and looking through that handbook and seeing stuff like the salary scale, that was the first cognitive dissonance moment for me, where I saw the salary scale said like $1,200 a month, $1,250 a month. I was like, I, I was making about triple what the players were making. And when <laughs> yeah. that clicked in my mind, and that's not an exaggeration. Yeah. These guys are making about $4,500 a year in short season. It's three months. Um, they're only getting paid for the season. I was making about 15 grand each summer. And when that clicked in my mind, I was like, holy shit, this is not the world I expected this to be. <laughs> Sam, you might want to catch that one. So it's amazing that you say this because I felt the same way. One of my first jobs in Fort Myers, Florida, I did play-by-play -play for the Fort Myers Miracle, which is a single season or a short season single-A affiliate of the Minnesota Twins. 
I did some play-by-play for them and getting to know some of the players down there. The biggest part of their day was when the post-game spread was out and they hounded house hot dogs. They crushed all of the food. Like me, I was making $18,000 a year. And what I realized, as you said, is they were making less than me. And so free food like hot dogs and pretzels was the biggest deal to them. They ate way more than a college kid because they had to because it was their chance to eat for free. Okay, let's pot because back up. Yeah, this sorry. This old system of the, of the dues system, they paid the clubhouse attendant dues. In single A, it would be something like 7 to $10 a game. And for that dues money... That's what they're paying to get is the leftover hot dogs after the game. Yeah. And now, like, with the changes with minor league baseball, with contraction and all that, that's changing. The major league affiliates are now providing food. But those, my favorite post-game spread story, Brian Roberts, 2012. Brian Roberts, all-star second baseman for the Orioles. Um, he was doing a rehab stint with the Ironbirds as I was the clubby there. And now, like, I'm sure you know this, when a major leaguer does a rehab stint, it's oh, yeah. tradition for them, they buy the post-game spread. Yep. And that is, we don't care about who the starting pitcher is, we don't care who's in the stands, all we <laughs> care about in the clubhouse is what is the post-game spread going to be, right? So Roberts is doing a two-game stint for us. First game, he comes to my clubhouse, he's, he's the equipment closet, he says, hey, I got here too late to get the spread today, but I'll get it after tomorrow's game. I said, okay, cool, what do you want to get the guys? He said, Applebee's. So then that game and the, the workouts for the next game, everyone's like, what's the spread going to be? Applebee's, Applebee's, <laughs> everyone's whispers, like secret. Um, all of a sudden, it's the second game of Robert's uh, rehab stint. We're in the clubhouse watching ESPN. We see Buck Showalter and Brian Roberts doing a press conference saying, Roberts is done for for the season. I think it's an oblique injury. We're shutting him down. He's doing season-ending surgery. All of Orioles Nation is like, oh, crap, there goes our second baseman. All of us in the clubhouse were like, oh, crap, there goes our post-game <laughs> spread. <laughs> That's how important that stuff is. You got first-round draft picks crying out, no, no Applebee's <laughs> tonight. I wanted those baby back ribs. My <laughs> Applebee's. Line chicken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So did I read that you becoming a clubby for two seasons, you actually had to sacrifice a relationship that your girlfriend broke up with you? It was a part of it. That was a big part of the issues. Like that, Much like the players, I got stuck into that world. Like in the off season, I got fat. I got, <laughs> I started to turn into booze. I was playing too many video games. I was like, I was way too good at Madden 2007. You know what I mean? Like franchise mode, winning way too many Super Bowls. And um, my girlfriend, she's like, do you really want to go back to Aberdeen? Like, you're setting yourself up to have no other choice right now. And that's what happened. And I went back and I got sucked in even deeper than ever. I was on the field taking batting practice. I was traveling with the team when I did not have to. I was putting on a jersey. I was literally, like I said, living in the clubhouse. Uh, and after that second season, uh, it turned into the end of our relationship. What is it like to live in a clubhouse equipment closet? You don't, you don't have a lawn. I guess you do have right field, but you don't have a kitchen. You don't have, I mean, and you're just waking up. You crack open the door, and there is the 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 clubhouse, the locker room. What is that like? Yeah. The fact there's no windows. That's the thing that drives me the most crazy is the no windows thing. And I guess I hadn't thought about that before I made that choice. Um, but this was my kitchen as well. Like I prepared food in there. So it's like the kitchen and my bedroom and it's the equipment, the smell of rosin. Like, are oh, you, yeah. do you know, like yeah. the licorice, the cancerous licorice smell of rosin? Yep. It yep. is so pungent and overpowering in the equipment closet. That's the thing that I remember most is like, if I smell <laughs> rosin, it gives me a little panic attack. Just thinking about being confined in that little box for a summer. So you were swinging deals for memorabilia and some big cash transactions out of that closet. Yeah, I would. Here's how the cycle would work. I had all of this equipment in there and nobody was keeping inventory of it, but me. So what would happen is, let's say a visiting team would come in. The Staten Island Yankees was really great for this. Their coaching staff loved Bud Light. 
So I would trade them a few caps, um, or they would, I would trade them a few cases of beer and exchange for that. They give me a few caps. And then I would give those caps to the stadium beer supplier. And then I would get like extra tips off the top. So like I was constantly making everybody happy, but scraping some off the top for myself. Wow. So you kind of had a bit of a degree of from the school of hard knocks from the streets, but also a bit of a business acumen here because you're taking product, you're kind of swipe, you're, you're trading the product to then make some money on the back end of it. Oh yeah. And that to me, that's not even the most nefarious scam that I had. I, um, the, the major league affiliate, in this case, the Orioles for the Ironbirds, they would provide bats for the players. And I would be in charge of all of those bats. They're terrible, like ash, bone rubbed. They'd snap like a toothpick. And in order to get a new bat, I would make the guys trade me their broken bat. Um, ostensibly, just as some sort of, you know, like, a, um, like some sort of honor system, right? But then what I would do is I would take those broken bats, I would slap the player's name on it, and then we'd sell them for $20 in the <laughs> gift shop, of which I would get a $7.50. Oh, cut. wow. seven fifty dollars per bat, huh? That adds up. Yeah. And what I found out, nobody knew who these bats, who these bats belonged to except for my little piece of athletic tape on the bottom. <laughs> and what I found was, wow, nobody wants to buy a Sam Kimmel, Manny Hernandez bat, but they really like buying Trey Mancini and Mike Yastrzemski bats. So then I would just flood the market <laughs> with Mike Yastrzemski bats that would just he never, ever touched. So I just cringed thinking about all of these Ironburns fans. They're like, oh, my God, I have a piece of history. Mike Yastrzemski's bat broken bat from single A ball never was his in the first place. Yeah. I hate to say it, guys. Right now, there is a fan listening to this show of the Orioles that is looking at his basement. <laughs> And in the memorabilia room is a Trey Mancini Aberdeen Ironbirds bat. And he's like, damn it, that's not Trey Mancini's bat. <laughs> Jaws <laughs> dropping to the ground. So upset. Consolation so, prize. Now you're part of a book, though. <laughs> who was the worst dude in the clubhouse? The worst player that just treated people like crap or treated you guys like crap? I hate, I hate to say it. It's pretty easy. Uh, a guy named Jose Navarre. Um, he would throw his – not a lot of guys like A lot of guys very respectful, but he would throw his clothes onto the ground, wouldn't um, – you know, would pay late on dues. And it was just – I would just take it, you know. I was – I did not stand up for myself enough. I would just take it. Oh, yes, sir, I got you. Because um, he was there the first season. By the second season, I was a little bit, like you said, a little bit school of hard knock style. I would kick guys in the ass a little more. But I was too green – to stand up for myself at that point. You get any pushback for writing this book and telling the secrets of the clubhouse? So far, <laughs> so one of the main characters, you remember Alan Mills from, uh, he was an old, he was a reliever for the Orioles, New York Yankees, 12 seasons in the majors. Uh, he was a part of a couple of famous brawls, one with the New York Yankees in which he knocked out Daryl Strawberry, one in which he was um, with the L.A. Dodgers, in which he was a part of the L.A. Dodgers bullpen that went into the stands at Wrigley Field and fought some fans. This is Alan Mills. He was the pitching coach for two, the two summers that I was there. So we were pretty close, but also butt heads a lot. Yeah. Um, he got his advance copy last week. I'm sitting here in Austin. I get a phone call from Alan Mills. Alan Mills and I talk once every five years. And he says... He says, uh, first of all, do you have water and power? I said, yeah, but it was touch and go for a few days there. He said, yeah, well, it's going to be touch and go the next time I see you meet after you wrote this book. He said, you made me the damn villain of this book. And I was just like, oh, my God. <laughs> he's not like, he's, we're foils. Like, we're very similar, but we we are very different at the same time. He's not the villain at all. Um, and so we had about a five-minute argument that felt like I was in the clubhouse again. Felt like I was getting yelled at by the guy who knocked Daryl Strawberry <laughs> on his ass. And by the end of it, he said, I just want you to know that I used to be a clubby too. And I want you to know that anything that happened, any disagreements we had was all in love and none of it was in malice. And I said, Mills, the same thing goes for this book. Any sort of jokes I make about you, anything I, anything I expose about you is all in love. None of it is in malice. And he said, that's really good to hear, man. It's like it cracked open a little bit. That's the closest I've had to push back. Okay, 
So this is the last interview that we'll have Greg Larson here on the show because he'll be dead the next time around from Alan Mills. We'll come and hunt him down and kill him in his Austin apartment. <laughs> That's right. If Mills hasn't killed me yet, he's not going to kill me. <laughs> so the book is going to be available April the 1st for baseball season. So look forward a little over a month from now, April the 1st. It's called Clubby, and it's all about behind the scenes, a minor league baseball memoir by Greg Larson. Greg, this is great stuff today, man. Good luck with the book. This is a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Thank you, sir. If you're not making tacos, I don't love you no more. <laughs> <laughs> oh, directly to my heart. Well done, Greg. Well done. <laughs> Nicely done. Greg Thanks, Larson, great job. Man that knows the show, huh? <laughs>